Okay. As much as this feels like an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, uh, this is about, I've been asked to moderate, and uh, I'm not really a very moderate person. Like, and I'm not really sure what moderate is, but we're going to talk about two albums today Love, Iron Soul, and England Keep My Bones. And uh, so, the sort of the bare bones of the album when were they released? Did you do them? Well, so there's. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I am God. I am your God. That's just, that's just the sound guy. All hail me. I slip the sound guy 20 euros. Um, well, so we're, we're doing the, we're discussing both of them because we're playing both of them this evening. Uh, and, and indeed, we've done the 10 year anniversary shows. We did Love Our Song in. In, in, in London. In London, thank you very much. Um, and, and we didn't even keep my bones in London as well, although that was because there was a pandemic. Um, uh, so, and we haven't played either of them in Germany or in Europe, uh, the continent, I should say. So we're playing them tonight. Um, in, in order? In uh, uh, well, in the entirety, yeah. But not in order. <laughs> because that would give the Game Boy. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to do that. Yeah, yeah, totally. But we did, I, I mean, there's, it's interesting kind of putting... The reason we're doing those two is I think it's fair to say that they are, the, of that period of my career, they are the more popular records, I think it's probably fair to say. I mean, it is. Um, <laughs> like, <laughs> the numbers uh, don't lie. Yeah, exactly. Um, and, uh, and, they, and it's interesting because they they, they're, they're similar records, but they're different, and they were both kind of turning points for us, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, Love Iron Song was 2008, and Your Bones 2011, so three years apart. Okay, great. And where did you record them? Wow. Well, Matthew? Matthew. Uh, oh, hang on. <laughs> were you there? Me. Yes, uh, hello. Uh, we recorded. Well, I wasn't there for Love Iron Song. Yeah, sorry. But... <laughs> Frank. Where did you record Love Iron Song? Ben, where did we record Love Iron Song? We recorded it in Hampshire. In, yes. In one of your friends' farms. Yeah, my, 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 one of my childhood best friends who lived on a farm near where I grew up, his parents had this sort of weird, just sort of building. A, a rat bar. A rat house. It was called the Rat House. <laughs> and it was like a barn, rat but they'd done it up so it had like a bedroom and a kitchen and a big open room. And I was there for Christmas. Uh, well, around Christmas seeing my mate and they'd just done it up and I was like fucking hell you could make a record in here uh, and then we asked them and I think we got it for free in the end because they found out that they couldn't legally charge us for it without having to get like a change of use thing done so handy so we, we didn't pay for the studio there we go <laughs> um, I mean we built the studio we took we, we took all of the gear down ourselves. Yeah, because it, it wasn't a recording studio, it was just a room, but it was a nice room. Uh, and, it was, and me and you went down, basically. Yeah, we, we did. How long? We were there for like... Uh, it was two stretches of ten days, I think. Yeah, it was cool. Three weeks. piece of equipment did you take down? Did you hire stuff? Or was uh, it, it was a combination. No, we, I think we hired in like a couple of tiny bits, but it was mostly mine and Nigel's, and I think probably some of Terence. Just sort of microphones and recording yeah. bases, basically. Well, and there was the stuff that we'd done Sleepers for the Week with as well, or mostly, yeah. right, which we did in Tarrant's house. We recorded the first album in Tarrant's house. And I guess the idea for Love Iron Song was to sort of do that again, but better. As in, with slightly better equipment and a bit more focus and forethought and all that kind of thing. And then uh, our friend Tristan Ivany, who you know, I think. Um, uh, who is a sort of producer friend of ours, came in and he mixed... Love Iron Song, and he later produced Ingle Keep My Bones. So there's a link there. Great. See. At the church. At the church, yeah. So I remember coming and clapping. Yeah. No, yeah, but hold on, you came to Love Iron Song as well. No. <laughs> yeah, you did. All of the Holloways did. The Holloways. Yeah, no, no, they came down. The oh, you weren't with them? Okay. The Holloways were on tour, and they were going through Hampshire, and their van stopped off at our little... I made a studio and they sung all the back and vocals on photosynthesis and St. Christopher is coming home as well and did clapping. I thought you were there. No, I clapped on uh... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, is is it England maybe? Maybe? Yeah, probably, yeah. That's what, I mean, it's really what made that song. So uh, where did we... Uh... <laughs> oh, there it is! <laughs> 
<laughs> will he be doing that for us this evening, Jay? Sure will, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> so, uh, Jay, tell us if you're on that album, where did we record uh, England Keep My Band? <laughs> um, it is that legendary studio. I've actually done a record there since. It's, uh, it's passed through lots of different people. It's called Church Studios in Crouch End, Muswell Hill. Um, oh, Crouch End. And it's like famous with Bob Dylan went there, didn't he? Uh, it used to be it, before. Who has it now? It was. What was the Babylon guy? David, David, Gray. David Gray. David was, Gray had it. And then before that, it was like Annie Lennox. Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart. Dave Stewart, Stewart, Stewart that's it. it. He set it up, yeah. And Dylan came there to. And he went to the wrong place. And no one was there. And he went to the jerk chicken shop around the corner. <laughs> Because yeah. there's a plaque that says Bob Dylan sat here. <laughs> I, don't know, I don't know if that happens everywhere he sits. <laughs> Every restaurant, Bob Dylan. Like following him around. A plaque. That's no, what yeah, I said. Yeah. To, to put it up. But like the, the story I heard about that is that so Bob Dylan was trying to meet up with Dave Stewart at this new studio, and went to the wrong address and like knocked on the door and, and apparently like an old woman just let him in. He was like Dave here, and she was like, oh no. <laughs> Uh, and I think like she, possibly her husband was called Dave and wasn't it or something. And, and the, so, the, apparently this is a true story. Bob Dylan just went and like sat in a kitchen and ate biscuits for about an hour until left a plaque. Yeah. And then just... <laughs> Where should I put this bad boy? Yeah. And does he carry them with him? That's the question. Does Bob Dylan have a pocket full of plaques? Yeah, he's got a, he's got a plaque person that follows him around. Like, Where do I sit? Screw it. In. But great studio. Amazing I mean, studio, yeah, and we hired the big room for like three days or something, and, and then did the rest of the record in the in the basement, basically. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, that, that, and it was kind of cool. I mean, my, my relationship with Tristan was kind of an interesting thing. We did, I did my first ever recording as a solo artist with Tristan in his bedroom, and did a version of Real Damage with him, and then I think he was like, "Cool, I'm going to be your producer," and then we did so we did. Cap Five Punk Rock and Slippers of the Week, and then got him into mix of our song. And he was like, Cool, I'm going to be your producer. And then we went and did Poetry of the Deed with Alex Newport somewhere else. He was like, God damn it. Um, and then he came in and he did produce and Keep My Bones and did an amazing job of it. And he was like, Cool, I'm going to be your producer. And then we haven't worked with him since. Um, but, but, <laughs> but not because we don't like him. He's amazing. I love him to pieces. Yeah, I don't yeah, know I'm... why we haven't worked with him since. Huh? No whispering, please, guys. Oh, he, mixed, he mixed the Live in Newcastle thing, didn't he? He did mix Live in so Newcastle. So we have worked with him since. Okay, there we go. Yes. Great. We love him. He is your producer. Yeah, he's a lovely man. And he now works with the lottery winners. Who yes, the we know the lottery winners. Oh. Oh. Fantastic band. Yeah, fantastic band. So, um, moving on. Tara, you haven't said anything. <laughs> I don't remember much from this period. <laughs> that was the first thing I thought when this panel came up. It has occurred to me that I, I don't. Did you play on Love Iron Song? No, no. I was right. okay. so, <laughs> like, the... I was just like, fuck, they're not in my house anymore. <laughs> yeah, right, okay, lovely. But there is a thing in here which was that, like, there was a sort of gradual process of, of um, concentration, I guess, for the idea of the Sleeping Souls as a band. Because when we did Sleepers for the Wee, well, it, actually, so the full story is I was uh, selling t shirts for a band called Ruben, who are a British rock band who were awesome. And they were on tour, and their support act was Dive Dive, which featured these two, and Nigel and Jamie. And um, I would, it was just as Million Dev was breaking up, and I sort of said, oh, I want to do this solo thing. And Ben said to me, well, we have a recording set up, should you wish to use that? And we play music as well, you know, we have guitars and drums and stuff. So we did Campfire Punk Rock there. Um, and then in 2007, we did the first tour, and the band name Sleeping Souls wasn't really a thing yet and then we did love our own song i played bass on most of the record jason Mulster from unbelievable truth played bass on proof rock i know it was just proof rock he stopped in to just get the coffee and it was like play the bass and he was like oh okay um uh so he's on the record uh, um and then i played the rest of the bass i played quite a lot of guitar did you play you played some guitar on it I played some electric yeah yeah um but we it was still kind of being largely sort of pieced together and then Poetry of the Deed was the first album that we did as a band because you joined on the Love Iron Song Tour. Yes. We won him in the card. <laughs> With Andy York. With Andy York, yeah. We didn't win me as such. <laughs> it's just we like, come in. We're all winners. <laughs> yeah, come on, um, we... Come on, you two. Uh, I um, 
uh, Nigel and I had a mutual friend who invited me to Nigel's house for a poker game. And uh, Nigel said that Andy York of The Unbelievable Truth was looking for a guitarist and a keys player. We supported Frank on tour. Frank stole me from Andy. <laughs> I remember there was a night when we were watching... Does anyone know the TV show Rome? There's yes. no need for this story. We were, we, it's a great story. We were all, as a band, watching Rome on that tour, and we were fucking addicted to it. It was a great show. And uh, we had a van with a, with, a, with a TV screen and DVD player. And there was one night when we gave you a lift back after the show to, from wherever we were back to Oxford. Yeah, and, uh, and we all got in the van and it was like, right, it's Rome time. We're in the van, it's Rome time. No talking, Rome time. And Rome went on and Matt was sat in the seat that's immediately under the screen, so he can't fuck, and, it, and wasn't up to speed on the show and was quite hammered. <laughs> and it, you, were, you were utterly charming. It was just really funny because we were all sitting there going, wow. Watch I don't show. remember being charming. And you were like, blah, 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 blah. And it was like, loads of people sat in front of you looking above your head. Like, <laughs> yeah. It's like, these guys fucking suck. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to spend the rest of my life in a van with these guys. <laughs> well, yeah. I seem to remember I got out of the van and said, you guys fucking suck, and then walked down the street, and Andy had to come and get me because I'd walked the wrong way in. <laughs> How did we, we come back? I think we were seeing you the next day, and you, as you got out, we said, see you tomorrow, and you, you, what you replied was, I can't wait to see what Ginger Fucknuts gets up to tomorrow. <laughs> there was some chap on the screen, I hear, so I wasn't interested in the photo. But anyway, it was all plain sailing from there. Yeah, and then we were like, this guy should be in our band. Um, uh, and it was plain sailing. So, so we, did, we did Poetry of the Deed as a band, but um, speaking candidly, my... I, I like folks. I, I, I don't want to be down on any records in case somebody here is going to be like, fuck you, it's my favourite album. Which happens more than you'd imagine. Um, uh, but basically, I feel like the songwriting on Approach to Diesel is this, but we, and it's entirely my fault, but we kind of rushed the arrangement of that record a bit. I wrote a bunch of songs and then we spent like 10 days in a rehearsal studio. You gave us four days to arrange it and four days to record it. <laughs> so it was fairly Which Yeah, I remember four days at Tarrant Yard and then four days at Beans Farm. It was no, I think it was it was it it was two days to arrange it, and then, and then two days and then two days than two. No, no, and then two days with the producer sat there, working out what he wanted to do with them. Yeah, and we then, could have spent longer days. on the arrangements. <laughs> and then you made us do two gigs in pubs. Yeah, the bully wasn't it? Uh, Wheat sheep the and the dolly. Little places in Oxford. Yeah, that was fun. That was great. That was but yeah, so we, and, and so the thing is, so when we came to making him keep my bones, it was like, from where I was standing, it was like, I'm really happy that there's a band here that I want to, that, that is now a, a, an established lineup of a band and we've been on tour together for a while by that point, And I wanted us to make a record together, but I wanted us to, yes, it's my fault, fine. Uh, but to spend a bit longer working out the arrangements for the songs. But also like, I remember working on England Keep My Bones arrangements a lot while we were on tour. Um, and we were, and, and he writing quite a lot of I remember writing a February Australian soundcheck at Janus Landing in St. Petersburg, Florida, because it was taking for fucking ever to get the drums sounding right or whatever, and I was just fanning about with the guitar figure. And then I wrote that song. Um, uh, and there was sort of stuff like that going on. And it was during long American tours with Social Distortion and Fog and Molly and bands like that, I was writing that record. And I remember, we did, remember the demo session in Texas? Jim Ward's place. Jim Ward's in El Paso. Yeah, Jim Ward from At The Drive-In had a studio in Texas. And we had one day off, which was a one, travel. On the whole tour, we had one day off. And Frank said, let's go to the studio and record an entire album. <laughs> <laughs> well, we were driving, so we drove. We were thrilled. Yeah, it must have been like, it's, Well, basically, West Texas is needlessly large. <laughs> and and uh, we, were we had to drive from Phoenix to Austin, I think it was, and you go through El Paso, and it was like, cool, let's stop at a studio, load in, demo an entire album's worth of material, and then keep driving. And they went, yay. Um, <laughs> and we did. Uh, and, uh, and that was the first time we ever demoed an album as well. Yeah, it was, yeah. And then you uh, graciously gave us three days to track uh, In Keep My Bones in the Bedroom. not true. It's... <laughs> We I don't know how long we had in the bit. I think we had, to track our bits, I think we had three days. I think there was one morning when you did dubs. No, 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 no,
<laughs> you gave me three days. Okay, I, maybe. I th yeah, I think you may have had three days. I think we had. I think we may have had even a week upstairs. We had. I remember this. I remember the numbers. We had fourteen days booked to record the album in total, and we used eleven. And I remember there was a big thing about the Tristan was like, I can't fucking believe it. This is weird. I don't like it. Um, but, wrapping up early. Yeah, wrapping up early. No, but it wasn't all in the big room. But I think we no. had. Because we did the drums in the big room. I think I'd only do my parts in the big room, hence why it's three days. Right. But we had three or four bases. days upstairs. We did the bass again. Yeah, we did the bass upstairs and then we did the sort of acoustics and vocals downstairs. And uh, we got shitloads of people in to sing on Glory Oh, Hallelujah. yeah. We did. So Glory Hallelujah, I got my. Dude, my mum was in for that, wasn't she? I seem to remember forcing my mother to sing an atheist gospel song. <laughs> <laughs> Which obviously was a strange day. In my life. Um, a bit, and Jay came and clapped. And uh, there it is! Come on, you and, um, and I remember that we, we, we were building the percussion tree. Yep. For, and in, the, in, the, in the kitchen, we got a cymbal stand and attached every piece of percussion known to humanity to it and then hit it a lot. <laughs> and it sounded all right. Yeah, that was right. What about things like uh, outside the music, the artwork? Who did the artwork for both of the uh, So the, Oh, yeah. So the artwork for Love Iron Song is a reference to another album, and not one person has ever got this without me prompting them. Larry Does anybody know? It is Lenny Cohen. But you've heard me say that before, I'm sure you have. <laughs> it's a reference. Right. The front cover of Love Iron Song is very similar to the front cover of Songs of Love and Hate by Lenny Cohen. And uh, it's a different colour scheme, but otherwise it's quite similar. And, it, and obviously a photo of me as opposed to a photo of Lennon Cohen. <laughs> which would have been yeah, weird and possibly actionable. Um, so, so, yeah, so, and I, I did all the artwork. My, our friend Greg Nolan took that photo on a, on a, outside him and Alice's house in uh, Archway. Remember the house? Yeah, and there was one, it was a, we found a white wall on the street in North London. And there was one, sh he showed me the kind of like the ones we didn't use the other day. And there was one of me jumping that, looks, that in retrospect, looks awful. Uh, apparently, I was quite keen on using that one for a while. I don't remember that. Anyway. Uh, Our song. Yeah, it looked a bit like a, it looked like a Maxino Park record. You know what I mean? It had that sort of vibe. But, uh, so I did the rest of the artwork for Love Iron Song. For him to keep my bones, um, does anyone here know a band called Ghost of a Thousand? Hardcore punk band? No. Uh, their singer Tom did the artwork for and keep my bones. But the whole vibe for that was it wanted to look like an old hymn book. Okay. Oh, we should talk about the album title. For and keep on, my bones. Hey. <laughs> we should talk about the album title. Yeah. Do you, do you, do you, do you guys remember this, the whole ring roll? It was the first time you didn't have a title ready for the album. Yeah. But you'd had the, the other ones, you'd had the title before all of the songs. I think in some cases, yeah. yeah. Was it not Ben Morse? It was, but there was, the whole, there, was the whole, there was the whole thing with the lawyers before. So we didn't have a title for him to keep my bones, and I have various suggestions for titles for that album. And my favourite one was called it Salvation Army, which was a, a, a reference to... It's, it's a lyric in, in Glory Hallelujah, We'll Be Our Own Salvation Army. I thought it was a super cool title for a record. Obviously, the Salvation Army is an existing organisation who are Christians, and uh, allegedly, because basically we... I sent this up the kind of food chain to the record label to see, you know, can we do this? Are we going to get sued? And we got a reply that was said that the Salvation Army were classed, by, uh, generally speaking, as extremely litigious as an organisation and that we were in danger of being sued into tiny pieces by the Salvation Army, which seemed unchristian. <laughs> um, but uh, so we didn't call it that. There was a whole bunch of other quite bad titles of that. Oh, was it? Um, Ghosts of Vaudeville? Yeah. From Balthazar, which isn't even on the record, I know! Um, and, uh, so yeah, there were all these kind of titles doing the rounds, but then in the end, uh, Ben Morse, who was our photographer and videographer, it sort of still is from time to time, uh, but um, he suggested England Keep My Bones, which is a line from Richard II. It's a Shakespeare play. Nice. And the, the lyric, there's no, no, it doesn't say that on the album anyway. There's, there's no lyric okay. in the given ways. But there is the lyric, London Keep My Bones, on the new album. Because I figured I hadn't used it yet, so I'm not. <laughs> Great. There we go. But yeah, so the artwork looks like an old hymn book. It does. It's got like jottings in the, in the margins. And you toured 
the album? What sort was that? Yeah, so, again, like we, you joined the Low Wire Song. I did. We, that, was a, that was a super exciting time, right? Yeah, sleeping on people's floors. <laughs> My point being that I remember that we did the first tour for Love Iron Song, we did the same venues we'd done for the, for the last tour of Sleeves of the Week in the UK, but this time around, I remember the first show, which was the album release date, which was the 31st of March 2008, I don't know why I remember these things, um, uh, it was at the Broodmel, and it was sold out when we got there, and we were quite surprised that it was sold out. Does that, did it finish at Scala? Where did we finish? No, that was the... That was the second, the second that was with you, that was the second the one I joined them. So the first one... Uh, the first one finished at the 100 Club uh, because that was the night... Oh my God, why do I remember Chris this shit? Chris T. Chris T. Chris T. So we had a... Uh, our friend Kira Hader was on keys uh, live for the first Love Iron Song tour and she jumped ship halfway through the first tour, which I was not stoked about at the time. And I called my friend Chris T. T., who's an English folk singer, some of you may know, who plays piano, and he joined the band at like two days' notice. There's a familiar theme here. <laughs> Two days notice, learned the set and joined the tour. And the last date was at the 100 Club. And I, my enduring memories of that, two things. First of all, Chris was so drunk when we went on that he like had his hat on backwards and was just falling off his piano stool and apologizing the whole time. And it was really funny, but he was quite, he was still really on it, key guys. And then also Cahir, our guitar tech from New Pagans, came down at the end of the night after we'd finished to, uh, to like say hi. Drink your rider? Yeah, to drink our rider. <laughs> and he came in and I prepped the security guard at the 100 Club that I was gonna do this. And I punched him in the balls and shouted, the game, and then walked behind the security guard. <laughs> <laughs> Bastard. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then he got me back next time, sorry. But that, that was, well, but so we did that tour and then, and then it was like, Chris wasn't gonna be a man full time. So then we asked Max to join the band. And then the next tour, it was, there was a really exciting moment for a lot of bands when things are starting to kick off where you do a tour at a level that you're used to where it's all sold out and then you do the next level up and then that sells out and it's, it feels like you're kind of on a roller coaster. It's really cool. Because the next tour we were doing went from playing to 200 people a night to 400 people a night and played the Scala and then it sort of went up from there. Um, nice. Yeah, and then Inky and Bones, the, the process has continued. I don't even, I think we were like in the middle of a tour when that record came out. I remember flying from Germany to England on the day it came out and buying a copy at the record store at the train station. <laughs> when there were record stores at train stations. <laughs> uh, yeah, and then, uh, and then we toured that one fucking everywhere for ages. All around the world. When did the Sleeping Souls become the Sleeping Souls? Was that around that time? Uh, you got to say something. I can't remember. Oh, no I did. Uh, busy man, Jay. I've only got so much space in my head. We were very busy. We were sat in the control room at Church Studios when something weird was being tracked that didn't involve many of us. I don't know. I seem to remember the, the, this, this conversation was such that it was like we'd all agreed it would be cool if you guys had like a band name as in Frank Turner and the and I my suggestion was the 1970s because they were all born in the 70s and I was born in the 80s, and their response was, fuck you. <laughs> uh, which seemed fair enough. Then there was, a, for a while, it was going to be Laser Child. Laser Child. I mean, it wasn't actually going to be Laser Child. Laser Child. <laughs> <laughs> terrible, terrible, terrible name. For all some American guys wanted it to be Laser Child. Uh, laser Child. Right, <laughs> Laser Child. <laughs> it's like a bad you buy a fucking, You buy a ticket to go and see that. Laser Child with an E on the end, by the way. Ooh, laser it's worse. Child. Yeah. Uh, you, uh, we were going to call Frank Turner and the 161 van because that was the number of Tarrant's house where uh, they all tracked um, Sleepers for the Week. Frank Turner and the Contraband? <laughs> yeah. There was one, one, but I think that's been taken by a number of since. Probably, yeah. No, and beforehand. Oh, it's a good job we didn't use that then. I think that's why we didn't use it. Oh, do you see? I get it then. All right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> And then, yeah, we started sifting through lyrics on the album. Well, always an unwise move. <laughs> what the fuck's this? <laughs> what have we agreed to represent? Um, and then, yeah, you guys said... I, I th I'd reached a point where I was like, you guys decide and, and I'll say yay or nay. Put it on the posters. Yeah, and, and Sleeping Souls, it was. And also the white shirts thing started around then as well. 
It's in it's in the album artwork, isn't it? Yeah. That was probably the first. Was that the first time they actually did it? Probably for that weirdo old school Victoriana photo. Yeah, which was in a weird studio somewhere in West London that was maybe a sort of S and M studio yeah, or something. <laughs> See, you remember that? Remember that? that. You don't, yeah. you don't forget that kind of thing. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah. but where has he brought us? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank What's going to happen next? Sign up for this. Yeah. So tonight, when you were playing these songs in a mysterious order, um, <laughs> is there any? Is, uh, what songs from these albums have kind of like lived on the set list and stayed, and which ones have you had to kind of go back and sort of relearn, relearn, yeah, and start again? With? What was the hardest one to re-remember? I guess. Uh, that's a half, maybe. Yeah, and most I, most of them have remained in, every, at least every now and then. Yeah, I really? mean they're definitely right, two okay. of the records that have photosynthesis is in every single night. Yeah, sure. Since, yeah, since it was incepted. Yeah, in <laughs> every one show. That's how I write songs. I incept <laughs> in a in a capsule full of goo. <laughs> That's what I call that. Um, <laughs> but yeah, so I mean, in, in terms of words, I would say that like uh, photosynthesis, Long of the Queen, probably proof rock as well. It's pretty it, more regular than some. Disappeared, so probably more. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, from England, disappeared, stray, believe. Uh, are the big, are the big hitters, a Peggy, I suppose. I know, but there were, uh, we've also we've done the ten year anniversary of both these records recently, so it's so none it's of sort of on deck. Two dust. Young, young Callum, though. <laughs> Round of applause, Callum. Um, Who's uh, done a phenomenal job of learning everything to the extent that he's reasonably sure he knows more of our back catalogue than any of us. Uh, I'm not even kidding. Uh, he, has, he has a folder about this high that's, that's full of notes for literally every single song. Every song. fucking song. He called me at one point uh, last year during one of the uh, interminable English lockdowns and he said, Are there any B sides we're never going to play? And I said, I don't know, I mean, probably not, because we do the Lost Evenings and stuff, but why do you ask? And he said, I've learned every single song on every album. And I said... I want more. Yeah, I want more. <laughs> I was like, there's probably some songs in the albums we're not going to play, to be honest with you. So, uh, but, uh, but yeah, so he's done a great job, and he is going to do a great job this evening as well. Very nice. And, um... You got any particular... What's your favourite song off the album? Ooh, Tarrant. right, Tarrant, come on. <laughs> One. Both. You got yeah, two one for each. Yeah. Come on, T, you can do this, I believe in you. Glory, probably, of England. Great. Glory, hell yeah. I remember you playing that to me when you... You, you, you are the genesis of that song, one of those. You're uh, like, shall I? I was like, fuck yeah. No, I remember exactly where we were. We were on a tour us outside the Winchester Guildhall. Okay. Um, and we were on that tour with Fake Problems. Yes. And uh, my, my grandfather was a priest, and it's not quite so straightforward to say... Once he died, I was okay to write that song, um, but so, uh, subconsciously, I think that was in there. I'd written the chorus, and I remember, and nothing else, and I played it to you in the top lounge of that bus, and you were like, you fucking dickhead, finish that song. Yeah. Um, and you, you, you got really exercised and irate about it. You were like, you have to finish that song, you coward. Um, uh, so Still I did one of my favorites. Well, there we go. Oh, you might hear it tonight. There it is. <laughs> Hey, go on, one more, one more song, a song of love, song. I'm just going to say about Glory, one of my favourite memories <laughs> attached to that song was being picketed in Norfolk, Virginia by oh, evangelicals yeah. with yeah. signs saying souls, souls don't sleep, they, they burn in they hell, burn. weeping <laughs> and roaring. <laughs> we went and shot a photo like yelling, taken with them. Yelling at, yelling at anybody going into the gig. The guy, the guy, there were two guys with the megaphones, right, yeah. and they, they had no idea who we were, because we went out, someone was like, dude, you've got to go and see this, and we went out, and they were shouting, Frank Turner is the Antichrist, and um, <laughs> we lined up and got our photos taken with them. <laughs> and they, they didn't know who we were. <laughs> it was amazing. Know your enemy. Yeah, yeah, it was fucking brilliant. I felt like, because, you know, I grew up listening to Iron Maiden and Black Sabbath and stuff, and they all got picked in the States. And I was like, finally. <laughs> Great. Yeah, that was good. Right, come on, tell your favourite song off Love Our Own Song. What, so what songs are on Love Our Own Song? <laughs> Give me a multi-choice. Uh, <laughs> Love Our Own Song's one of them. Yeah, that's not, not bad. bad. It's all right. Love Our <laughs> People. 
Oh, I do like Love Worth Kids. Yeah? Do you want to go with that one? Yeah, I'll just go with that one. There we go. Love Worth Kids, there we go. Fair. <laughs> Yeah, I don't, it's not on the album, actually, is it? But can I say front crawl for Love Iron Song? Ooh, deep cut. Um, uh, yeah, you can. Um, and for England, I'm going to say Nights Become Days. Very nice. Very nice. Matthew? Uh, Redemption and Love Worth Keeping. Uh, two votes for Love Worth Keeping. That's okay. a good song. Jay? Maybe we should have learnt it. <laughs> Maybe we should have done. Sorry, we apologise in the advance. Uh, I could do with knowing some of the songs that are on You can say Proof oh. Rock, you're in that one. You are in Proof Rock. Proof Rock. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and that was easy. Uh, that one, I mean, that, re that really follows me around that song as well. Really? The amount of people that are like, uh, take your hat off, let me see how bored you are. Oh, dude, I'm and, uh, sorry. <laughs> oh, don't worry. I'm, I'm no, 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 it is actually, it is <laughs> But it's also like, but people are like, are you standing on a chair tonight? You know, like, <laughs> many years later as well. It's good. I mean, it's, uh, that's what, I mean, that's, I remember, I have a very, very vivid memory of having a rough mix of that song from the studio and going to Nambuka, uh, which was still, it was peak Nambuka at that point in time. And uh, I was in, me and you and Tree, who's our tour manager, were in Tree's bedroom and I played it. And you were both like, yeah, that's cool. Uh, and, and, and then Dave was there as well. And he has to, and it, there's a line, Dave Danger smells at strangers. And Dave went, do you just say I smell of trainers? <laughs> and like, I wasn't kidding. And he was like really quite put out. He was like, he said that like- New he, trainers? He called Jay St. George. He said the tree's really safe. He said, I smell of trainers. <laughs> And I said, no, Dave, that's, that's not the lyric. Um, uh, and, and we made our peace with each other. <laughs> uh, Long Live the Queen, that's on that record, isn't it? It is, yeah. That would, that, I remember first hearing that as well. That would be a, a, a favourite for me. And then Ingrid Keep My Bones. What changed on that? Um, still Believe, I would say. I'm Glory Hallelujah. Still, oh, still Believe, just for the amount of harmonica solos I've done over the years. Oh, yeah. <laughs> How many harmonica solos have you done over the years? Well, I mean, I've done a few. I got, well, one tour I got banned, because I was too loud. <laughs> <laughs> banned by who? I t someone. You, I presume. But it, it came down through the ranks. <laughs> Yeah, it was just like, you're not I, doing it to I got I like, what? I hate that. This, you was too loud. I, it might have been Ben, because it's Ben's it was Ben. but you do it on you, so. It was Ben. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but it just gets turned off. Oh, OK. I don't think it was getting turned off. I think that was the issue. Anyway, I took it as well as I could. I took it <laughs> quietly. <laughs> Raging have out. You, have your harmonica back? No worries. <laughs> the COVID harmonica. Yeah. <laughs> but I remember I did it on the fly once when I wasn't on the tour, and I was just there, and... Uh, Piss just ran straight for your mic and watched everyone go, No, not Frank's mic! <laughs> you was fine with it. And I come back, he's like, Well, you're supposed to do Ben's mic. I was like, Stop now, sorry. <laughs> go straight for the middle of the stage. Yeah, cool. yeah, of course. I mean, it's the, it's the beans on toast way. Um, but yeah, that would be a favourite. Good. And uh, I mean, like, so both. What are your favourite? Oh, what my. Oh, fuck. Um, <laughs> Uh, I mean, actually, right now, Love Both Keeping's getting a vote from me as well. So we really should have learnt this song, shouldn't we? <laughs> <laughs> yes. It's yes. got a few hours. Yeah, OK, thank you. <laughs> um, thanks. No, that's what we'll do with our afternoon now, thank you. <laughs> we have the afternoon off, Frank makes it's a, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a slightly weird song. It's a slightly outside of the, the norm for that, at least that period of songwriting for me. And, uh, and the, the middle and end bit is really good. I mean, I think all of it's really good. Thank you. Yeah. That's very nice. Yeah. Hang so on what, a minute, I'm going to moderate this. You're not just blowing smoke up. So, uh, <laughs> what's, your, what's your favourite song, Love Iron Song? That, that one. That's what's your favourite song on the other album? <laughs> <laughs> uh, probably Disappeared. Um, as we've done, I mean, how many versions of Disappeared have we done over the years? Three. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, told you, Stop. we've Probably done more three. than three. Sure. Maybe four. There was a finger pick first half. Or oh, yeah. Thing. So it was the a cappella intro for a while. Yeah, yeah. The album the, version. The album version. <laughs> what is, what is <laughs> the thing? <laughs> Has anybody ever got? <laughs> what is the thinking behind changing up a song? Um, keep us on our toes? Keep us, yeah, keep you and you on your toes just to keep it exciting yeah well also it's just it's, it's kind of fun i mean i, I think about anything to do with set this from the point of view of, of somebody in the audience like with stuff like that i remember going to see tori amos 
and um, go they uh, in, in like probably like ninety seven or something ninety eight somewhere in there, and she opened with this like tribal drum like jam thing that was incredible and super loud, but it didn't bear any relation to any song of hers that I knew. Uh, and it was, but it was heavy as fuck, and it was really cool. And then she started playing piano, and it was still like, this is cool, I have no idea what song this is. And then she just started singing, it was like, I've got me some horses to ride on. And it was a new version of that song, and it blew my fucking mind. It was like, how cool is this? You know, there was a reveal, and then suddenly I was, I was in the room. Similarly, when I was a kid, I used to get the Cat and Crow singles that had the alternative versions of B-sides. Do you remember them? No. Right. <laughs> You're a Cat and Crow fan, eh? Yeah, but I don't, didn't get too big, stuck into alternative versions. Of okay, what did I just they, listened they, to they, Mr. This, Jones. They're cassette singles, which came in cardboard sleeves. Nice. In the 90s, yeah. Eco-friendly. Yeah, the B-sides, <laughs> apart from all the plastic. Yeah, I was going to say, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> packaging. The, uh, the B-sides, they, so there was like a sort of like, they had an alternative version of Rain King as the B-sides of Mr. Jones. And it was just a kind of like, half-time kind of folky country arrangement with lots of rock song on the record. And it was just, it, for me, it was now the thing of like, oh shit, that's the same song. On a, a flip side of that, I remember me and my girlfriend at the time traveling to Ross Gilder uh, to see Bob Dylan. And halfway through his set, my girlfriend, uh, Claire, was a big Bob Dylan fan and she was bored, stiff. She was like, I just wish you'd play something. And I can't even play like, man in me. I was like, this is man in me. <laughs> <laughs> you just don't fucking recognise it. Yeah. It's just because it changed up so much, just yeah, hold yeah. down and kind of killed his own tune. I went to see him <laughs> once and he, he played piano behind the drummer for the whole fucking gig. <laughs> and it was like, all right, mate, I get it. <laughs> Fuck you two. Um, yeah, just come on, do, do a hit. Yeah, I mean, the following night, it was Bob Dylan and Neil Young both playing, and the following night, Neil Young came out and kind of played all the hits and did, like, you know, Love to be in there. Yes. I mean, I love both. Not, not, not on stage and knocking Bob Dylan for the record. But um... this just is put it on Twitter now. <laughs> Beans on toast. Slags off Bob Dylan. <laughs> Get a check. His Alcoholics Anonymous meeting. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Actually, funny you mentioned Neil Young because Neil Young was such a huge part of my thinking about songwriting around the Love Island song time. I was definitely trying to play. I was trying to be Neil Young to a large degree in that period of my songwriting. Neil Young only records in certain. Uh, moon phases. I know, I did know that. <laughs> Epic. It'd be good to be able to sort of have that yeah, it's freedom great. in a studio. Yeah, yeah. Like, <laughs> I think when's the studio well, free? Don't fun. worry about that. What's the moon saying? Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's funny because like I remember at the time like that was Love Our Own Song was probably when people started using the term folk punk around what I do. Yeah. And uh, it's not. It's a funny old expression. I mean, I'm sort of like okay. But it wasn't really what I was aiming for, particularly. I was trying to play country music, essentially. Sure. Um, and, but I learned how to sing and play guitar in punk bands, and it sort of mashed up. But it was, it's, it's an interesting thing, because like, everyone's like, oh, folks, this is a little folk punk song. And I, that's definitely not what we were thinking about it when we recorded it, I don't think. It's then. probably good. What? <laughs> <laughs> but it was like, I mean, just press record, mate. Well, I know, but I mean, I guess the, 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 what I liked about... I don't, I don't mean, I wasn't thinking punk at all for that song. Well, but exactly, or indeed that, well, I don't think either of us were thinking about anything particularly directed musically while we were making that record. It was kind of nice. You know what I mean? I remember us just, it was, re uh, that was a really pure memory for me. Me and you skipping through fields of wheat <laughs> in the house of countryside. <laughs> And then in the evenings. And in the evenings, re recording. One punk, one folk. <laughs> <laughs> But it was, it was a, it was a, that was a, one of my favourite recording experiences. That. It was good. It was, we should go back. We did go back there once. We demoed something else then. Yeah, you we know. demoed uh, Cleopatra in Brooklyn there. That was, that's like Positive, Positive Songs. Songs era stuff. And, a, and a couple of others, yeah. Um, least of all Young Caroline. Yeah. Like that, right? Yeah. yeah. Uh, and, and, and Little Aphrodite. Yeah. Before we go too far down this wormhole, I'm going to do some moderating. <laughs> <laughs> do we, shall we, does it, should we do some questions? Is yes. That you do normally do on these sort of panels? Yeah. Yeah, let's do some questions about them albums. <laughs> you stick your hand up and I'll point at you. I'm not going to bring the microphone no, over. No one? Yes. No one go for it. Nice and loud. Are there any songs that you wrote that you thought were going to be absolute bangers, but they weren't? 
Yeah. Hold on, hold on, that's, what's the second half of the question? Sorry. The other, the other half is any songs you just threw on the record and they ended up being like something you always put in the set. Uh, I mean, broadly speaking, yeah, you, it's very difficult to predict what's, how a song is going to land. Um, and there are songs that I've written that I think... I mean, it, it's not even... It's still the case in some cases that some of my favorite songs I've written are not necessarily your favorite songs. <laughs> Um, <laughs> on those, on those albums. On those, I mean, you must have known that, like, God Save the Queen was going to be a, you know. Long live the Queen, Jay. Don't be. Also, also, I might. Can I just quickly throw in that I recently discovered that the number of people who think that song is actually about the Queen <laughs> is not zero. <laughs> And I've received some pretty confusing emails <laughs> in the last week. Uh, but that, that tune, you must have been like, this is going to be a single and this is... It's not, yeah, oh, yeah, right, I whether think so. this I is a strong song. I've got a vague memory of writing that in Winchester at my mum's house and thinking that it was a good... I remember you playing it at, what was that place in Archway? The Hideaway? The Hideaway. When is it, like, Greg used to do a night there? You know, remember? yeah, you know that night in the Hideaway? Yeah. Do you remember that, do you know, do you know about that night? It's fucking glorious. So Greg booked it, yeah. right, and the bill, there was two people playing, it was me and Dan, who's now Dan from Bastille, Bastille and there was about four people there. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, yeah, and you were one of them, and it was like, Jay, it was a Greg, clearly had an eye for music, an ear for music, I should say, but it couldn't fucking promote a show to save his life. Um, because there was no one there. But in, earlier this year, me and Dan had the number one in the UK back to back, week on week. And nice. uh, we both sent Greg a message saying, good work. <laughs> back to the four sales, Greg. Yeah, yeah, yeah right, exactly. <laughs> but, um, uh, but yeah, so yeah, sorry, I played it then. I mean, yeah, I, I remember thinking that was going to be good. I remember finishing Proof Rock and thinking that that was a song that felt like it was in a slightly different league to other ones. Right. Uh, we, we usually game. tell you which songs are, should be on the records. You ignore us. Yeah. <laughs> We're right. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I, do, I mean, I'm trying to think. I mean, like, I, I still, I sort of referred to it earlier, I talked about this before, but like, I still can't quite remember why Bathazar is not on it, Keep My Bones and End Up As B-Side. It strikes me as slightly insane. But it, What's and, the other one that should have been on there? The slow. Oh, um, the drinking song, the next round. The next round. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great song. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with having strong B sides and stuff, though, isn't there? True. No. It's all right. Any other question? Well, hold on. I was... Oh, sorry. I <laughs> never finished the question. <laughs> um, I was trying to think. I mean, like, I remember writing Wessex Boy in about, th about <laughs> four minutes or something, and it wasn't, or at least the main part of the music, I wasn't convinced that it was particularly memorable. And. It was, apparently. And you so, found that out after it was recorded? Uh, kind of like the label were like, that's going to be a single. Right. And I was like, huh. <laughs> um, and, and then, yeah. And then, although the other thing with that, I remember shooting a video for Wessex Point in Arizona. <laughs> a, song, a song about Winchester. And uh, we were in Arizona and it was like, we've got to do a fucking video for this. So Ben Morse, who's back in the UK, gathered a bunch of people to busk on Winchester High Street, and we filmed the performance bits in a car park in Phoenix. And uh, despite the best efforts of, uh, of Ben to like grade the footage so it looks like we're at least vaguely on the same continent, it's very apparent that we're not. Uh, uh, ben also did the video for uh, uh, Proof Rock, didn't he? He did, and it was awful. It's so bad. It's so bad. <laughs> That was the first it's, thing I would do. I'm surprised, I'm surprised he carried on, you know, I'm surprised he's still alive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that video's really bad. I mean, because it's like, it's one of the few kind of visual, um, uh, you know, it's Nabucco and it's full, you know. Yeah, and it's, it's boring. It, it, yeah, and it's full, for, everybody's there, isn't it? And it's yeah. just made everybody look like absolute idiots and like the whole thing oh, was like, fucking it yeah. looks like sort of Grange Hill or something. <laughs> <laughs> I have, I, I mean, there are... It's on YouTube. <laughs> my, my track record of music videos is not 100%. <laughs> I'll say that. Um, anyway. Go yeah, go for it. Um, going further than like favourite songs, is there a favourite lyric that you really like? I mean, yeah, probably. <laughs> uh, I mean, it's simply, I, mean I, I don't want to sound like I'm on my mouth, but there's, one of the nice things about going through and learning older songs for Lost Evenings particularly is that there's a fair few bits where I'm kind of like, huh. 
That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Do you know what I mean? And like sort of stuff you sort of forget about for a bit. I mean, um, the, let me think specifically about this for a second. Um, I mean, well, to go back to it again, love of keeping, I, I guess, you know, when I lost all you have something to lose that whole section. I think that's quite good. Uh, well done, me. Well done, <laughs> um, <laughs> and then, uh, and then on, on England, uh, uh, what songs are they? Uh, Redemption. Well, I'm pretty proud of the whole Redemption. Does bringing back an old song, can you remember where you was sort of like physically and also sort of mentally at the time? What, uh, uh, yeah, except it's not, com right, I've, it's very rare for me to write a song in one sitting. It's sort of, there, there'll be bits of it arrived in time. So to take the example of Redemption, <clears throat> I remember having a conversation with my friend Rob. He used to be a barman of a bar in Greenwich and we'd been on an absolutely demented bender and I'd just broken up with Isabel and he'd just broken up with his girlfriend and we'd done a lot of drugs and stayed up for a long time and uh and then we were having we ended up having a conversation about our dads which was a bad idea in that sort of emotionally chemically suggestible state and uh and um that was the first incarnation of redemption stuff from that there's like the line I tried so hard not to send to my father all of that started and I just remember his flat above that pub being where that sort of kicked off um so there's there's like Flashes, yeah. But then I also remember Redemption was the last vocal that I recorded for In Keep My Bones. And I've been being, we recorded it in North London, and I've been behaving myself really well and being really good. And then I went to see you play um, at the Dublin Castle, I think, um, and with Dave, and ended up getting really quite shitted. Uh, and then waking up the next day and being quite hungover and croaky and thinking, fuck, this is really unprofessional. And I went in and my voice was perfect to sing Redemption that day because it was supposed to sound sort of... Hangovers in studios go well, surprisingly well together. <laughs> yeah, well, they can do. Let's, <laughs> let's not make a rule out of this. <laughs> God. Yeah, oh, the moderator was... Oh, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Waiting for permission from Jay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> fire away, sir. How did the... If you're looking back today, how did the process in, uh, on working on an album change? So, uh, yeah, good sorry, question. My, my, I lost my voice for some reason yesterday. So oh, okay. like, oh. <laughs> good work. Um, I think, I think, well, I mean, the, the most obvious thing, I think, and this applies to all of us, is that we we have more experience of being in a studio and of what you can and can't achieve in a studio. That's so techno there's not been any massive sort of technology advances in that time. It's not like you switch from tape so, to no, digital or it's, it's like still using the same sort of. The first two records were Pro Tools. So Pro Tools, right, yeah. Uh, but I think, and then also the second thing is there's just been more, to be blunt, there's been more money around. Do you know what I mean? Like when we made Slickers of the Week, we didn't really have any money. And when we had Lower and Tom, we didn't really have any money either. And it was like, when we got to England, it was like, wow, we're going to spend two weeks in the studio with fucking Guns N' Roses. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? So that, that, I think, has been the main thing. And then I think we've got to know each other better as musicians. <laughs> We're allowed to put more time. We're allowed to put more time in. Hang on, everybody. It's Aaron's got something to say. <laughs> I think there's the, there have been differences on every record in the way yeah. the we, the songs have been arranged, and yeah. they've been quite calculated in some respects, <laughs> in order to give them a different feel and a different yeah 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 yeah, 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 yeah. basically to, to do things differently. Because if you go in the, to a studio and you just use the same methodology every time, to an extent, you're going to get this, that template's going to be put onto the music. So by changing the way you do things, you're, you're, you're going to get a different result out of the other end. Yeah. Oh, yeah, that's fair. I think that's a quotable line. <laughs> by changing the way you do things, you're going to get a different result. <laughs> <laughs> He's putting it down for a song. <laughs> I actually, I was checking this out, I thought that was going to be the line to finish up on. But no, we've got a <laughs> glorious ten minutes left. Um, so can you stop moderating? Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> yes, sir. Um, Go for it. The themes in um, Keep My Bones um, around sort of the history of where you're from and mortality, why did those develop into the album? Uh, it's, it's a, a fine question, and uh, yeah, yes, uh, the themes of um, kind of 
history, and I guess I would, if I may be so bold, national identity and that kind of thing, that, uh, and indeed mortality that informing the chemo bones, like where did they come from and why? Um, is that a fair? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it's a good question, and a lot of people have noted that I think there are three different instructions of what to do with my remains when I die on England chemo bones that are contradictory. <laughs> um, so, uh, have fun with that, boys. Uh, <laughs> what bit each? <laughs> Uh, but um, I'm going to cut you up into three pieces. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> Baron's not going to wait for you to die. <laughs> Just to know who the uh, executives of your uh, estate and will, Francis. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, uh, now they're going to kill me. Um, uh, the, the, the national identity thing is just kind of interesting. So, in, um, in kind of 2009, 2010, there's a period of time where, generally speaking, we would tour the UK full band, but quite often, at least initially, I would go to America or Europe or wherever on my own, for budgetary reasons, I didn't have any money. Um, so I did quite a lot of touring in America, particularly on my own, as in, I, you know, without a band or a crew, but quite often, like I remember jumping in a van with Fake Problems, who are from Florida, um, with Look Mexico, also from Florida, um, uh, Gasline Anthem guys, and, and so often I'd be the only English person in a crowded van, a crowded bus, and then in the evening in a crowded room as well. And it really just slightly gave me the opportunity to think about why it is that I understood the rules of cricket and nobody else did, in, in that, <laughs> or, or whatever. And, 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 and like, it's funny because there's a degree, the way that that record talks about national identity to the extent that it does, feels quite naive to me in a, well, in a way, now looking back actually, just in the sense that the world has got a lot angrier and more kind of gotcha in terms of social media and that shit now than it was then anyway. But nevertheless, I just kind of took it as completely obviously understood that it wasn't like a nationalist statement. Do you know what I mean? Like, fuck all that noise. But I, I, I think, I, you know, anyone's allowed to examine where they're from and how it makes them feel about the world and all the rest of it. But I remember after the record came out, having to like say to a bunch of people, I'm not like proud to be English. That's a, I, that's a, that's a sort of meaningless statement to me. It's, it's, it doesn't mean anything. Um, uh, and I, do you see what I mean? There was a degree to which I just thought it was obvious that I wasn't that type of person. And in retrospect, if I was to make the record again, I might put in a couple more just sort of disclaimers almost, do you know what I mean? Um, uh, I don't want to go spend too long talking about that, but that was interesting. The mortality thing, I don't really know. I just think about death quite a lot of the time. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I don't know. What are the three things that you, you, you want to dump? Oh, well, hold on, somebody, uh, the, one, of, one of them is to be um, I painted into the the London's water supply. Yeah. Yeah. One of them is to be buried at sea in the English Channel. I can't, there is another one. It's scattered something, isn't there? Yeah, scattered, smothered, covered. <laughs> 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 like, like hash browns at the Waffle House. Um, <laughs> I can't, so I can't remember what the other one was off the top of my head. I'll remember it halfway through the gig tonight. I'll go, ah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> Reconvene the panel mid-gig. Yeah, everyone, back to the Nick Alexander street. <laughs> um, uh, but yeah, so the death one, I don't really know, though. It was just kind of floating around. But yeah, it, it's, it's a funny thing. Like, I, I, I was sort of interested in... I was also stuck... I'd spent the first section of my solo career using the word folk quite a lot, and in kind of a slightly ideological way, as in it. To me, it meant community music, and it meant music that didn't involve a separation between performer and audience. Uh, and, and probably it meant acoustic guitar, and that was what I meant by the word folk. And as my career got a bit bigger, I started rubbing up against the kind of trad folk community, who, in a way that I think is reasonably legitimate, argue that folk music means traditional music as a music of unsure authorship. And it became apparent to me at that point that I didn't actually really know very much traditional music. And um, there is a fair amount of English traditional music. There's, the Irish, Scots, and Welsh tends to be more famous um, because it tends to be underdog, uh, you know, for good reasons and all the rest. But I'd spent a bunch of time around then listening to shitloads of, like, weird field recordings from Cecil Sharp House and stuff like that, where they, they have kind of, like, there's all these bananas wax cylinder recordings of, like, farmers singing eight verses of a song in 1924 or whatever. It's very strange. Um, and, and so, like, English curse kind of came out of that sort of territory. Nice. Nice. We've got time for one more question. Who's going to ask it? <laughs> Go right at the back there. 
<laughs> nice and loud, please. There we go. Um, and secondly, if you had your time again, are there any traction points from the albums? Ooh, that's it. Cool uh, songs, mate. Yeah. <laughs> Beyond our pay grade, isn't it? Um, <laughs> I don't. You told me which of the best songs, and I ignored you. Is the statement? There's many songs we've tried to encourage you not to put on albums, but you don't listen to us. <laughs> <clears throat> the sleeping cells, for instance. Um, <laughs> uh, you know, in broad strokes, yeah. I mean, um, I'm always slightly reticent to answer this question fully because, again, I I did once mention there's a song on my debut album that I really, really actively dislike, and I told somebody that, and they went, "That's my favourite song," <laughs> and, and and weren't like kidding. And then I felt like a terrible human, so I don't really want to do that. But there's actually on these two records, not really. I think these two stand pretty well. There are songs that possibly should have been on them that aren't, the Bath Sub, Next Round, whatever, Front Crawl, that I occasionally wake up in the middle of the night and, what, and think about those two versions of the song Jet Lag. Um, the, first, the rock version that's on the first three years was the original version. We were working on the studio and it just wasn't coming together somehow. And then there was a piano in the corner of the room and I started pissing about with the chords on the piano. And, I remember I had my eyes closed and I opened my eyes and you were very quietly putting microphones in front of me and you were like, don't stop. <laughs> <laughs> but then... <laughs> it was pretty late at night after some, it was. some more liners. Yeah, yeah. But then the, the, the other thing, and this is my fa well, probably my favourite bit of trivia about Love Iron Song, if you listen to the record right to the end, the last chord of the piano version is that like, rings out and then I go, Plump, and I'm like, I think I say, that was the one, and you're like, and you can hear Ben in the distance go, was it? <laughs> <laughs> the reason for that is because it wasn't actually a studio that we were in, uh, it was, you know, so it didn't have like soundproof doors and shit. From memory, you basically set up all the mics and you were like, just keep fucking going, I've left it running, play it round and round and round and round until you get it right, and I'll just go and be somewhere quiet. And you were like hiding in a cupboard or something? <laughs> um, just what he does. Yeah. <laughs> like, or maybe the kitchen, but you were somewhere where That's you were bad. being as quiet as you could because of all the microphones and it was a really roomy sound on the recording. And, and I think I, it was about like the 14th or 15th time around and you were, I could sort of got, you obviously weren't making any noise, but I could sort of sense from the cupboard this like, for fuck's sake, hold in a sneeze, play the fucking song. And, and also like, you know, I can cut to a beginning and an end of this together for fuck's sake. We don't need one take, that's fine. Uh, but I kept going and I finally did it. And then I said, that was the one. And you were like, was it? <laughs> and it was, uh, and there we go. So, but and, I mean, I do also like the rock rest in that song. But in the, to answer your question, in this instance, not really. No um, regrets. Maybe. Not about these two. To ask me about some other albums. Which, which album is Mittens on? <laughs> <laughs> Taron pipes up at the end. <laughs> I mean, first of all, how do you not know? And then we're going to wrap it up. I know what you're It's a positive song. It was a, it was a rhetorical question. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not your favourite song, is it, Tim? <laughs> Well, let's not if finish on that note. Like now, what is your favourite song? I don't have a single favourite song. Just say one and then we're going to wrap it. Up. I don't know any of the song names. <laughs> I know them when they start. <laughs> you like 1933, that starts with you. Yeah. There we go. Oh, oh, that's, no. that's the Taron Anderson fucking bass solo highlight of the fucking two notes. It's not of three. Yeah, it wasn't when we tracked it though, was it? No, they we left you two alone for five minutes. We came in, it opened with a fucking bass solo. It did. <laughs> <laughs> what the fuck is this? It got, it got, it got vetoed. It did. <laughs> fucking great. That's coming on the ten year anniversary of Be More Kind. What is your favourite song? Come on, Taron. You can do this. I don't know. I mean, I have a lot of thoughts on your songwriting. <laughs> You can do your own panel tomorrow. Cool. <laughs> oh, Lord, cool. How about this? Last evening six, we have a panel that's just Tarrant sharing his thoughts. <laughs> no one wants that. I, I, I beg to differ. Yeah, yeah, I don't want that. Yeah. <laughs> cool. Well, I think it's time, so we will wrap it up. Unless anyone's got anything else to say. Uh, big thanks to you for coming. There's, uh...